Anybody know? Come on, you got your cell phones. Google it quick. M-A-B-E-N. What does it mean to be a maven? Don't be shy. They're only live streaming, that's all. <laughs> Somebody tell me what a maven is. Uh, all right, so what's this panel? So that would mean color experts advise on digital media creation and tools. So that's what this panel is. In case you don't know, Maven sounded a lot neater with color than color expert. Okay, I am Teresa Marie Ryan, and I'm the moderator for this panel. And uh, with me today is Nicholas Bazarian. You want to raise your hand? Sorry. Then Jose, Jose Ishavaria, Mike Burdock, and Danielle Feinberg. Okay, so can I start now? Am I on, am I on schedule? Okay. I am I but Okay, so I'm gonna cover a few color fundamentals before we start off this panel to give us a common ground. How many color models either add or subtract? Did everybody already know that? Okay. As long as you're with me. Color wheels spin and specify color harmony. Human color perception is imperfect. Important to remember here. Okay, so this is the RGB, red, green, blue, adds with lights. We're gonna cover that a lot. Danielle's gonna cover it specifically since she does lighting. Cyan, magenta, yellow, key black. This is for printing. We have uh, Pantone up here, so they're gonna cover it. Nicholas, Nick is gonna cover that a little bit. And then here's the first one that you ever learned. How many people remember red, yellow, and blue from kindergarten? Everybody should raise your hand, because I promise you, you cannot pass kindergarten. I have a sister who's a kindergarten teacher. It, worldwide, you cannot pass kindergarten unless you know your colors. Okay, so here is the first test. Red and green, when you mix them together, what do they produce? Hello, here? Yellow, somebody knows RGB, right? So remember that when you're talking lighting. All right. So blue and yellow, what do they produce? Mix together. You want to say green, right? Because you remember it when you were five years old and you mix the colors, right? But blue and yellow produce in lighting? White. Okay. So now we pass that quiz. Okay. Newton was the first person to develop the color circle that became the color wheel. So what he did is he had the spectral colors and he had colors around here. Now, does anyone notice something, a color is missing that often appears on the color wheel? Does anyone recognize what's missing? Perfect, otherwise known as magenta. And who put it there? Color wheel history has existed a long, long time. Goethe in 1810. Goethe put it there, and it stayed there ever since. Newton only addressed spectral colors. Goethe put magenta on it, and it stayed there ever since. The first guy to do the 3D beach ball concept of colors, a guy named Rung, also in 1810. All right, so here's how we build a color wheel, right? You take RGB, and amazingly, C, M, Y, K, oppose it. And you put this together, you combine it, and you have a color wheel. All right, so I'm gonna cover some color harmony because I know Jose is gonna cover this a little bit in his talk with uh, Adobe and I wanna make sure you get the fundamentals. A monochromatic color scheme, one color. I'm here in the key of yellow. Then you add a tint, a tone, or a shade. Tint, tint is white added to one color. Tone, gray added to one color. Shade, black added to one color. You'll see this an awful lot in terms of if you do a lot of business graphics, you will see a monochromatic color scheme very, very often. This one right here. Analogous, analogous color scheme. Boy, that went fast. Well, that's three colors next to each other, and I have no idea how to go back. Save me. <laughs> Help, because I'm live streaming, and I don't know how to do this. The red button. The red button. Help me. I'm, I hit it. 
Oh, well. Oh, cool. I'm sorry. Everybody need to see color history again. This thing is jumpy, jumpy. We're going to repeat it again. All right. Now she's only going to press it slowly. Analogous. Three colors next to each other on the color wheel. Three adjacent colors. This is a very frequent color scheme in fashion design, often used. So now we slide off. Then complementary, the one we know, we covered that earlier. That would be the blue and the yellow opposing each other and together. Now, look at my outfit carefully. What do I have on as a color scheme? What is my color scheme? Oh, come on. You can't flunk this. Very good, very good. What, louder? Yes, very good. Very good. I purposely did that. <laughs> All right, color perception is imperfect. I like jazz music. A guy named Wes Montgomery is an incredible jazz guitar player. And he said that when you tune a guitar instrument, it's imperfect. Within five minutes, it will be somewhere else after you put all the tuning in it. That same thing is true with a color in terms of calibrating a display. It is also true with many other aspects of color. It's imperfect. So Munsell discovered this over 100 years ago. He decided he wanted a 3D effect in terms of a, looking at a 3D space of color like the beach ball concept. And he discovered that perceptually, we tend to see a little stronger on the red side than we do on the blue side. There's a lot written on this. I won't cover it, but just, just know that this concept does not work perceptually, which is why you don't see the 3D color sphere a lot. You can, ha you can get a beach ball or you can look at it, but it is not perceptually accurate. Okay, now another big trick, right? Oh, gosh. It did it to me again. I'm in big trouble. I'm just too fast. Uh-oh. You want to see it again, don't you? I work so hard on these slides, everybody. I just want you to see them so many times. You will not forget this color harmony. All right. Let's rock. We're imperfect. All right. Don't get easy on me. Easy. All right. Our human brains cannot differentiate. When it goes, you, what you see goes into your eye, then it goes to the optic nerve. Our human brains can't tell a difference between a yellow light and a green and a red light shine simultaneously. We cannot tell the difference. And as a matter of fact, you're all being fooled because this projector is actually not producing yellow. It is producing green and red. It has green, red, and blue lights inside of it, and it's producing green and red, and your eye thinks that you're seeing yellow. And if you want to know how do they do all these color perception tests, they get people that do not show to have a color deficiency. In other words, they're not red, green, colorblind, which I think Mike may cover a little bit later or somebody may cover on this panel. But if you pass that test, they have you stare at various test lamps and match the colors. So all that data about human color perception is based on various different people's eyeballs. Now, I can't be sure that you see color the same way that I see color. So just remember, I said it was imperfect. It's imperfect. Even the studies are the best they can be, but they're imperfect. So I wrote a book on this stuff, and I'm going to have a book signing at 12.45 PM over in the bookstore, and I'm shamelessly promoting myself. If you would like to come, I would love it. All right. Now, why do you care about digital color? Because printing a real object in color is challenging. And Nick from Pantone looks at this all the time. Why do you care about digital color compositions are often uncharted, uncharted territory? And Jose at Adobe lives this all the time. He's going to discuss that. Smartphones and digital devices seem to have improved color displays every year. Every time Apple gets up, it seems to improve its color gamut. So Mike from RIT is going to talk about color appearance. 
and we're at SIGGRAPH, and you always wanted to know how they did color lighting in animated films, right? It's one of the things you always wanted to know, and Danielle's going to cover that from Pixar. So without further ado, I guess, Nick, it's your time. Nick is uh, the manager for Pantone Studio and other digital products at Pantone. All right. Um, I, I will attest, uh, I learned more from Teresa Marie's book than the previous five years of my career. So please read her book if you're interested in color. It's really that good. Um, so I'm Nick Bazarian. I'm from Pantone. Uh, one of the things I love about working with a product that designers use is that they tend to geek out over it. And designers do artwork with our products. And so this was one of my favorites. Love to start off with this. Um, color is, it's truly a journey. And we're gonna go through Pantone's jersey for, uh, journey from physical color to digital color to eventually appearance today. Uh, my own color experience has been a journey as well. Um, I actually started out in the painting world. So I was a real latecomer to the whole RGB scene. I've always been a, a red, a yellow, and a blue guy. And I stick to that. I then worked for another color company. Didn't do anything with color there. Are there any IBM people here? That's exactly what I expected. <laughs> right. I went to work for a uh, colorful school and then got a business degree there and then eventually jumped ship and said, all right, let's go get back to color. Let's find Pantone. Um, and I've been working with Pantone for the past three years. Uh, truly been an awesome experience. Um, so actually, Pantone is two companies. It's x and Pantone. Um, has anybody here heard of x before? All right, that's great. Um, so Pantone, if Pantone is the, it's the color trends, color of the year, it's standards. We actually do custom color as well. So when people find out that we don't have enough colors, they'll come to us and say, please make this for me. X-Ray, on the other hand, X-Ray gets into all things producing color. And so whether it's paint, so it's matching and mixing colors, um, plastic formulation, get into dye formulation, we get into quality, quality control for all of this. Um, print is a huge part of what we do. And uh, the next stage of what we've been working on is actually um, digital rendering, 3D rendering. And so this image here is a 3D rendered image. Um, used, uh, produced with our tax system, which uh, I'll cover a little bit later. So again, this is Pantone's journey from digital to physical to appearance. So starting off with physical, we're going across materials. And this is really more of an overview of what is Pantone's business. Like, what does Pantone actually do? Um, it, it's really color specification simplified down to, I guess, as easy as it can get. Um, Pantone produces, you know, a fan deck, right? And it's, it's something you could actually carry around with you. Um, out of millions of colors that you could possibly, possibly see or choose, only a few are actually achievable. And so Pantone standards represent something that's achievable for a designer. So when they pick a color, they can actually go and produce it, and they know that it can be produced in real life. The risk when you pick something and it can't be produced in real life is that the color changes and then everybody's expectations get changed and everybody gets mad. So really briefly, we actually have two color systems. Did, does anybody know that we have a fashion system in addition to a PMS system? So like one, two, couple hands. So it's, this is really market-based. Everybody knows uh, on the left the common print colors. This is the Pantone matching system. It's PMS. And we have 1,886 colors in that system. Um, it's used for print, but we also find that it's basically used for everything. It's just people pick it up, it's simple, it's easy. There's a whole other color system for the fashion market, which is actually very nuanced. Um, there are more colors in that system, and the reason for that is 
Uh, we find that fashion designers and product designers, they need a lot more light colors, they need a lot more grays, they need a lot more neutrals. And so this system has a lot of those that you probably wouldn't actually see in the print world as much. So these colors go across six different materials. So we have paper, ink on paper, we have paint on paper, cotton, nylon, polyester, and then plastic. Um, but it actually, it gets more complex than that, even though we're trying to keep it simple with the colors that we have. So um, when you get into the print world, you have spot color, which is when you're actually mixing the ink. So you're putting it together beforehand to hit the color that you want before you print. We have spot color on coated paper, on uncoated paper. We get into CMYK and uh, extended gamut CMYK, which is the really process color. Um, and then finally, we have metallic inks. So um, as much as it's in everyone's best interest from a physical production of color standpoint to get down to a manageable color set. The complexity of even doing that means that we have to have all these different materials and all of these different types of colors out there. Um, but I guess the point is that communicating with color, with physical references, it's really simple, really fast, and generally speaking, it's pretty easy. Um, where we see problems and where we spend most of our time uh, as, a, as a product team and even really um, as Pantone going out and working with customers is that there tends to be an over-reliance on these physical references um, and they can be a nightmare for the people who are eventually designing and producing with them um, and making them real. And so if you've ever seen a you know, store shelf and you've got tons of colors out there, um, it, the complexity is massive in this case. You have more colors, you have more materials, more suppliers, more licensees, all of these different factors, they contribute to total chaos when it comes to producing a color. And so that complexity ends up being waste, it's expense, uh, it's longer lead times, you have quality problems. Ultimately, um, the more complexity you have and the less control you have over it, uh, the more likely your product is going to be uncompetitive on the shelf. And that's, that's a huge deal for companies. Um, besides that complexity, another reason this happens is when people are actually relying on the physical color all the way through their production, there are these little handoffs that happen. And every time there's a handoff, whoever takes the color might change it a little bit. So you might, you might adjust the color that you received from a brand manager in Adobe and you might change the, the values a little bit and then those values get changed again when you hand them off and then the person printing or producing the ink, they'll change the color. Um, it's a game of telephone. By the time you get to the end state, the color that was started with isn't the color that was ended with. This happens all the time. And so it res results in the loss of uh, total brand identity. So I think to, to end with physical color, they're a great starting point. In fact, they're probably the, the best, easiest starting point someone who is gonna produce a color for real life could start with. Um, but they really shouldn't be the, the be all end all. So that takes us to digital color. And th this is actually, this is where I spend most of my time. I take the products that uh, our physical color team produces on the different materials, we digitize them, and then we actually make them useful for some of the, the different, um, I mean, basically anywhere where there's value, any situation where somebody could try to answer a question with a color or predict something with a color. Um, so I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide because Teresa Marie just did a pretty nice quick overview, but you know, RGB, hexadecimal, HTML, you guys work with these all the time. Um, where, we, where we can help improve the situation in some cases is actually just making the color capture and getting all of those values for you accurate and easy. So some of the things that we've done, we have a, a little mobile app called Pantone Studio, um, and we also have these cards that we've produced where it's like a little credit card. You can put the hole over the color, take a photo with it, and the card will actually calibrate the camera on the phone to, to get an accurate color. Um, so we have a couple other technologies that are coming up in this space as well, but where we can add some value is just making that initial point of capture really, really easy, and then getting it into your design. Um, where we spend actually most of our time is on the production side of color. So this is where people are working with CMYK because they're gonna be printing it. Um, they might be using uh, LAB values. Do you, guys, do you guys work with LAB values? See, see a bunch of hands. Um, and primarily spectral. Uh, 
So spectral data is actually, uh, from my standpoint, probably the most valuable piece of data that I can give to someone who's going to be producing a color. Um, so spectral data is really, it's, it's, it's that color's individual light curve across the spectrum of color. Um, if you're used to working with LAB, LAB is, it's, it's a sort of a, I guess, sort of a variant on this, but um, I'll let Michael explain a lot more later. Um, LAB is like a color, it's like a color's fingerprint. Um, the challenge with LAB is that it represents a color under one condition. So like one illuminant, one set of lighting, um, one observer condition. Um, and if you change any of these things, the LAB value actually changes as well, which is why you might have seen for a, like a Pantone color multiple LAB values out there because there's multiple ways to actually record that color. Um, so spectral data reflects all of the different conditions um, and it can provide a producer a much more versatile set of measurements for them to produce with or measure against. And so what we've done is we've actually gone and we've taken our, our original colors, you know, this is what you might see in our books or in our, on our you know, cotton products or whatnot. We've measured them and we've said that's our master standard. Um, we've actually said, okay, if this is a master, this is the point of truth. And if you have a point of truth, um, how can we predict how that point of truth is going to change depending on the different types of materials that the color might be produced on? And so we've actually gone and we've produced our colors, measured them the way they're supposed to go with a master standard, and we've actually put them out on different materials and created a dependent standard of them, which is, you know, in this case, this is a Starbucks coffee cup example, the original Starbucks color, but on a brown carton holder. And then we measure the delta E between these, and we actually give this data to, to the people that produce color so that they can measure against these different targets rather than the original Pantone data. Right? So this is just one way that we're making the data versatile to color producers. For designers, we've actually tried to bring this in the form of design simulation. So if you were designing something that was going to go on a label or packaging or some sort of physical product, we could tell you how your design is actually going to change in color before you send it off to get produced and find out that it's all wrong. Um, so this is uh, just a, a quick snapshot of one of our pieces of software from Pantone Live, where you can see some of the different materials we have. And then uh, over here on the right, these are actually delta E, uh, uh, delta e values, which really in, in the color space, it's the space between the colors. Um, so we can show if, if you started with this 2727C, if you put it on this brown cardboard box, it's going to look pretty terrible. We're going to we'll tell you just how terrible it is. To make this a little bit more practical, we've actually put this into the design file. Um, so we built a plugin where you can take your design file in, in Illustrator and actually simulate how those colors will change. So this is, this is one example where we actually, you know, if we had worked with this company ahead of time, we would have saved them a production run of, of I think, 50,000 of these little uh, flip-flop holders they produced. So um, when you're working with the spectral data, instead of doing these handoffs and getting this game of telephone, we're actually providing a common point for people to measure against so there is no handoff. So if a color is picked at the beginning of a design, and the producers know what color that is, they can access the spectral data, and depending on whatever material they have, they can get the reading for what that material is supposed to be, and then they produce their color, and there's no, there's no major color change. So we're trying to avoid this. The last piece of our journey is that we're actually starting to go beyond this. We're going into the 3D space, and so you know, we recognize a lot of our customers are much bigger than this. They have thousands of complex materials. They're not just doing packaging. They have global production sites. They have very color critical requirements. I mean, think about something like a, like a car, how critical it is to have the color right. And their, their lead times are demanding. Um, communicating color is just not going to cut it. And so some of the work that we've been doing um, is actually to, to really step it up and say, can we bring it to appearance? Um, and so. We've gotten into, and this is more on the x ray side of our business, but we're merging it with the Pantone side. How do you take the appearance of something and communicate that? And so um, these are just some examples. These are digitally rendered scans using our tax scanner. 
Um, my colleague Mark uh, from x is going to be giving a talk about this later on this week. And if it's something that you might be interested in, highly recommend you attend his uh, talk. We also have a, a booth in the exhibition hall. Um, but in, in communicating appearance, you know, you're ultimately, you're communicating all of the different attributes, including the color that something might have. And this is, this is, uh, this is actually just some of the, the pieces that go into this ecosystem that produce this. We have a tax scanner, um, we have a, a material hub, and we actually have a place where you can look at the, the digital rendering next to the real product in a light controlled condition and see how it appears in real life. Pantone's going this direction. We're gonna be providing our materials in the future scanned digitally so that someone doesn't even have to necessarily um, you know, send a physical sample back and forth. They can use the 3D materials. Um, so with that, I'll hand this off to uh, our next speaker, Jose, but I want to say thank you. Hi everyone, this is Jose, research scientist at Adobe. And today I want to show you some of our most recent research around uh, interactive color tools, because as you may already know or you will see today, color can be very tricky. So uh, in the end, it requires a lot of tweaks, a lot of trial and error and, and fine control. So the way we interact with, with color, it matters in the end. And yeah, this is something that uh, we are doing on the, on the research side of the company, right? So these are prototypes. So don't ask me uh, when and where this is going to be released because I don't have that information. But uh, I can tell you that this is what we are using to inform our product teams about how to um, extend our existing apps. So I would like to start with, with Adobe Color, which has been around already for some time. And is the video playing? No? Well, this should be a video. So uh, in case you haven't used it before, so um, this is a tool to create color themes, right? So you can move the, the color swatches around and, and it's able to enforce these um, different harmonic schemes that, that Theresa was uh, mentioning already. So it's very easy to start from scratch and create something that looks uh, kind of compelling. And what I like about this tool is that uh, to me it shows the most important features for, for intuitive color tools. So it provides the, the right level of abstraction, so then the, the interaction is greatly simplified. It has a purpose, right? It's something that it's especially tailored to a final application, and it's consistent with theory and the mental models that the users have in their minds when, uh, when working with color. So uh, with these concepts in mind, I'm going to go through different uh, projects that we have been working on, and we'll see how we can apply them to make more intuitive uh, con color tools. So for the first project, I'm going to talk about some color harmonization work that we have done with university collaborators. And here the idea is that uh, instead of starting from from scratch using our tools, maybe you have collected already a color theme from different images, from, from your own um, inspiration, and you have a, a color theme, okay? So when you visualize that over the color wheel, um, now we are focusing on analyzing the distribution and see if we could improve it even further using these uh, harmonic schemes. So for example, we can make them snap into a single split, which is a variation of, a, of the triadic scheme. We can make them complementary, monochrome, square, or a triad. Okay, so this is already looking promising, right? Because it's helping you to uh, improve your colors, but um, maybe uh, the algorithms are not capturing your full intent, right? So you want to, to refine that because 100% uh, harmonization is too, too strong. So we can allow that refinement as well. And that's something that I don't know if it's going to show properly on the projector, but uh, this is something that when you are doing uh, serious work with color, uh, this kind of fine control matters a lot, right? So we are able to, to provide that on top of the arbitrary uh, manipulations that you can do already with, with existing GUIs. 
So the, this is all cool, right? Uh, we have been able to do that uh, for some years already, but more recently, uh, new techniques have appeared to do what we call uh, palette-based image recolorization, right? So starting from the, the image, we can extract the color palette, and now we can edit each of these colors arbitrarily, and the results are going to reflect on the, on the image. So this is very, very straightforward, and, and it opens like new possibilities. And apart from arbitrary edits, we have embraced this to close this uh, loop or this workflow where uh, we can start from an image, manipulate the uh, colors. In this case, I'm going to show some results of harmonization and see how a harmonized image could look. Right? And here you have the different variations for the, for the different templates. And some of them look more realistic, others look more stylized. And of course, maybe this is not um, exactly what you're looking for, but this can be a very good starting point to fine tune it from, from there. So moving on and continuing with, with color transfer, uh, I'm going to present a, another project that uh, some colleagues and, and other collaborators were working on. And here we have this other practical case where maybe you have already nailed your, your color theme and uh, you have blocked uh, the design for a brochure, but then when you are adding the images, then eh, they, they don't look completely right. So now we have technology to make everything consistent uh, between themselves, but also with the, with the color theme uh, very, very quickly. And the nice thing about it is that uh, we could have achieved this in, in very different ways, but thinking again in terms of control and intuition, we pose the problem as um, extracting the color palette from the images, finding the group color theme that represents all of them, and then uh, establishing these relationships automatically between the target color theme and the group theme, right? And the good thing about that is that um, algorithms are not always right. So in case uh, they didn't capture your intent or you want to do further corrections, then uh, you can do that very quickly, like in this case for the sun on the image, we can make it have a, a more natural color very easily. And finally, related with color as well, but with a different application, in this case for, for digital painting, I wanted to talk about color mixing, which is uh, something that other uh, colleagues uh, have been working on. And in this case, we were revisiting the um, whole painting experience, right? And this is something that in the real world, it's very, very fun, very engaging. And, and part of it is because of the color mixing process, right? That's the very core to, to it. And, and it's something that it's intuitive. It's very fun to mess around, right? So we love that uh, even when we are kids. But that's something that didn't translate very well to the digital realm, right? Where the user needs to go back and forth between the color picker, the, the parameters for the, for the brushes, testing out uh, what happens over the canvas before actually painting over the, the actual artwork. So these colleagues, they uh, took into account all the pros and cons from the real world, all the pros and cons from the digital world, and uh, from the, yeah, and they came up with this idea of a playful palette, which is a new kind of uh, mixing interface where the user is in control of these color blobs that uh, can be set very easily with existing color pickers, but then they are able to interact with each other very organically based on their position, right? So they directly expose the range of mixtures and it's very easy to, to pick from, from them. And this is something that, uh, this is uh, from a prototype and you can see how efficient everything turns. Well, it's obviously speed up, right? But you can see that the, the mixing dish can be um, manipulated anytime and then it's much more streamlined to just dip the, the virtual brush on this virtual palette, and we can even keep track of the, of the arrangement of the blobs and, and keep track of the, of the history. But in the end, it makes for a more enjoyable experience. So this is all I have today for you to, to see. And I guess we can agree that interaction is key when, when working with color. And for that, uh, new GUIs are required. And this is just the, the tip of the iceberg. So of course, we, we are working on 
a lot more things around these these topics, and there are also uh, lots of different interesting combinations that can be uh, that can arise from the things that I already showed today. So expect more from from us in the in the near future. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. We appreciate this. Uh, my name is Mike Murdoch. I'm an assistant professor in the program of color science at RIT. And um, if you didn't know that there was a color science, I forgive you for that, but there are only a handful of places in the world where you can really study that as a degree program, and we're proud to be one of those places. Um, my background is kind of a mix of uh, engineering and computer graphics and human technology interaction, and my research topics typically include displays and lighting and uh, recently augmented reality. So um, today I'm going to talk a bit about oop, yep, that button. Good. Talk a bit about kind of what makes up color science and getting into the color appearance part, which all of our speakers have been talking about today, which is great. So color science typically entails, at least from our perspective, a bit about color vision. You know, how, do human, how does the human visual system see color, perceive the world? And these differences like uh, you know, converting the spectrum to, uh, to perceived color, the difference between a, a spectrally yellow light compared to the combination of a, of a red and green light, that kind of thing is, is part of that color vision. Color physics, when I say that, I'm really referring to how do you make color uh, in a lot of cases, whether that's pigment-based things, light-based things, how do you modulate color with uh, diffractions or other uh, physical uh, characteristics like that. Color measurement is a big piece. Uh, X-Rite was mentioned. That's what's one of the big companies in color measurement. Um, it used to be that color measurement was really, really hard, and, and our lab actually in the early 80s, long before I was there, uh, did a lot of color measurement as a business, um, and now it's now there are instruments that are much more affordable and, and, and accessible for people. And color appearance is, well, everything about color is perceptual, right? You don't have color unless you have someone observing it. Uh, but color appearance is really about how things influence the color that you see. And a couple things I want to mention today, to come back to this point that I think Teresa said imperfect, I would maybe say relative, because... Uh, sounds a little uh, nicer, but anyway. Um, there are spatial effects and temporal effects that always affect what you see when you look at color. Spatial meaning what's happening in the neighborhood of the color you're looking at, and temporal meaning what you looked at for the last few minutes affects what you're looking at or what you perceive when you look at something new. So let's start here with this kind of spatial things. Um, there are a lot of edge effects with color, and depending on where you're sitting, this might be better from the front or the back, but this is just a typical grayscale. But you probably notice, if you look closely, that e at each of the boundaries, there's sort of an enhancement of the contrast, right? And so these are, I promise, flat gray patches, but you probably see a bit of a gradient in each one where they sort of uh, have a contrast thing. That's called mock bands. It's fairly well known as a phenomenon, but it's just to remind you that the edges, things happen at the edges of it in, in color. This also works in color as opposed to grayscale, just to show you what that looks like. Um, and if you were curious what a color science professor paints his living room like, well, this is an answer. I was pleased to find, and I didn't do this with this intention of having mock bands on my wall, but I was very pleased that this demo, which I've shown many times, you know, is not just like an artifact of putting things on a screen, right? It works in paint on a wall uh, just like this. So, so there you go. Um, another edge effect, which you may have seen before, is surround effects. Here I have two gray patches in the middle, which I promise are the same. And when you put a different surround on it, in fact, when I go back and forth, you might think that that left patch is changing color, or changing lightness in this case. Uh, but that's just an effect of the surround, and that's, that's also fairly well known. But these, these kind of things are, are a big part of what, how we describe color appearance. Again, this also works in color. You probably perceive a bit of a hue difference between these yellowish patches just based on the surroundings that they have. Surround also affects contrast, so not just the, the lightness you perceive, but the amount of difference in, in colors here. So hopefully you see that the patches on the right look sort of closer together in lower contrast, and the patches on the left look further apart and higher in contrast. This is well known from imaging, from you know, cinema, when you're going to show a movie in a dark theater, uh, you, you, you have to render it in higher contrast because it's going to be perceived with lower contrast like this. 
Again, this also works in color. It can change the sort of lightness and the, and the hue effects that you see in the, in the colors that you're perceiving. And I mentioned this, the, the cinema example. Of course, this works for images as well. I show a black and white image here just for simplicity, but probably if you look carefully, the sort of, uh, sort of perceived you know, depth and darkness of the shadows and the highlights between these two images is different just based on the surroundings. And if you don't see it, I will just blame the fact that it's not big enough in your field of view and hand wave a little bit. But that's another fun thing about color appearance is that whatever you perceive is, is the thing. You're right, because you're the observer, right? So we've already mentioned a little bit about color representations. Here I picked some uh, interesting purple. You probably know about RGB and HSB or HSV. CMYK is another representation. Any of you work with XYZ ever? And I don't mean 3D coordinates XYZ, but uh, it's always confusing when you're talking about UV and U prime V prime and XYZ in 3D and XYZ in color, but anyway. Um, XYZ is really much like RGB. It's an additive color space, but the the primaries of XYZ are imaginary colors, which is always fun to describe to people. But it's, it's referring to how people see color in their, in their eyes. The last one here was also mentioned earlier, um, LAB. Um, all of these designations are basically telling you the same thing. These are all representations for this color, for this purple color in this thing. Um, for those who don't know much about LAB, let me just give you a, a little map here. The L star in LAB is really short for lightness, and that's the, the scale up in, in this sort of 3D diagram I've drawn here, the scale up and down from dark to light in the center. The A star axis is kind of an opponent color axis between red and blue, and, or I'm sorry, red and green, and the B star is between yellow and blue. And we call those opponent axes because they really are, they really do oppose each other, right? You can have a, say, a reddish yellow, or say a reddish orange or something like that, or you can have a greenish orange or a greenish yellow, but you've never really seen, I hope, a bluish yellow. That doesn't really happen in real life, right? Or a, or a greenish red, because of their opponent colors like that. And if you've heard of LCH, that's actually the same space, but described with a cylindrical coordinate system instead of a Euclidean one, where chroma is the distance from that center L star axis, and hue is the, the angle around the cylinder that you make with that. Most important thing here, though, is that white is at the top of this box at 100 L star and 00 A star B star. So 00 means it's, it's achromatic there and, and 100 is there. But white is always kind of relative, right? So the biggest question in color science is maybe ironically often, what is white, right? Because in a given situation, uh, white is very indicative of what people are adapted to. And uh, if you can answer that question of what is white in a given situation, then you can do a lot of computational things to figure out what color appearance is. On a screen like this, the sort of maximum value that you drive it at is kind of the white. And that white is different than the white you see on the ceiling, which is the brightest, say, object in the room from your perspective. And you're okay with that because your perception is relative, and that's fine. So we adapt, this is getting into the temporal things, temporal side of color appearance. We adapt to color and luminance level all the time. Our visual system is really good at this. You don't even notice that it's happening. Um, I show you two photographs here of a color checker under a 3,000 Kelvin light, a warm kind of indoor light, and a 7,000 Kelvin light, which is very cool daylight. And here I've used a camera to do it and, the, and set the camera white balance to uh, somewhere in between, so it really shows you that the, the, the difference here. If you were to look at these two color uh, these two situations, this color checker under two different lights, you'd probably see something like this. What do you think? They look kind of the same? So this is, this is the adaptation part where the, the physical stimulus that your eye is seeing is quite a bit different. But because you can tell what is white, it's kind of obvious looking at this where the white patches are. And it doesn't have to be white. It can be achromatic, somewhere gray, somewhere in between. In fact, that's why I chose to wear this nice gray shirt here to help you chromatically adapt and not perceive me as more uh, green or yellow. So. If, if you look a little green, it might be because of your, your dress. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, but the point is, you're very good at adapting to this and sort of without even knowing that you're doing it, normalizing your perception of the scene for the white that you see and, and adapting uh, to that. If you look really carefully, and I can't totally promise this thing will show you the difference here, you might perceive that the red patches here are different in lightness and the blue, blue patches here are different in lightness. Uh, just because the spectral characteristics of that color difference, or the, the lighting color difference does still uh, persist even if you've adapted to the white. So that's another level of detail if you're curious. So luminous adaptation is another one. 
you are in here in a sort of relatively dim environment, much dimmer than if you walk out that door into the daylight. Um, and again, you do this all the time without really noticing it. This picture is from a 20-year-old uh, SIGGRAPH presentation that created a good model of how you adapt to this, and this was used for like HDR tone mapping. Um, one point to make is that, oop, is that in all of these, the white, the background of these things is the same, right? Because again, you sort of normalize your vision to, to pin that white where it should be. The other thing is that this is showing that you, the color is much more enhanced so this, the, the point I didn't should have explained this to begin with, this is what uh, this scene might look like under very dim illumination of 0.1 candelas per square meter, and this is all the way up to 10,000 candelas per square meter, like uh, outdoor kind of lighting, and everything in between. And besides the white being the same, the real difference that you see here, or one of the big differences you see is the amount of colorfulness. So the, the brighter the scene, even when you've adapted to that white, the more colorful things look compared to how that scene would look under dimmer light. So you're still seeing the color, but they jump out more at you. Uh, when it's lit under better light. There's also a, a sort of uh, spatial resolution fuzziness that you get. So if you're, if you're operating under starlight, you can still walk around outside once you're adapted to that, but you can't perceive detail as well as you would have. So color appearance is kind of what I've been talking about all along. There are color appearance models that, uh, or computational models that try to predict what the, the appearance parameters of a given uh, color stimulus would be in a different situation. And really what they're doing is modeling the state of adaptation, the, both the luminance and the chromatic adaptation. So one example, the, the one that's oops, sort of most famous and standardized by the CIE is CCAM02. It was standardized in 2002, hence the name. And it takes inputs of the XYZ of the stimulus and the, the white in the scene, as well as the, the actual luminance of the background and something about the surround because that also affects it. And it gives you a bunch more information um, I mentioned LAB, which is always a reference to a white. JAB is kind of like LAB. You can kind of figure they're the same. But also gives you uh, chroma and hue, which are related to that. But colorfulness and brightness, which are sort of absolute. I said LAB white is always at 100, 0, 0. So on this picture here, the LAB white of any of these is going to be the same. But if you compute the CCAM J, that's the sort of a equivalent of that, or more importantly, the Q, the, the actual absolute brightness of that, um, those will respond to that difference in overall scene luminance. So if you're curious, there's, it's, there's a small update in, in 2016 to this, and there's also ICAM, which is an image color appearance model, which could be very interesting for uh, imaging and computer graphics applications, so check that out. So really, what do I leave you here with, right? That things are, things are relative, things are complicated. Um, what's my advice? We're supposed to be advising people. First thing is pretty simple, but worth mentioning, I suppose. Just know what to expect, right? These edge effects, these surround effects. If you take a, a logo with a you know, well-chosen Pantone color and you put it on a different background, it's gonna be perceived differently, right? So just be aware that that's gonna happen and don't be surprised. And with that in mind, check things. You know, have a look at what they do uh, when you do various things. If you are interested in CAMs, color appearance models, um, use them, right? They're, they do exist. There are open source implementations of them. You could drop them into a, a workflow of some kind, and I'd say, hey, maybe put one in Photoshop, if, uh, if, you know, as one of the choices in the pull down. Um, where white is kind of obvious, like in, on a display screen like this, this is, this is less interesting, but especially for HDR workflows where you have really wide dynamic range that you're compressing to, to, a, to a displayable amount and perhaps moving that around as, as you assume the viewer is adapting, then color appearance becomes even more important. So uh, that's, that's one, one place to watch out for. So while we're plugging things, uh, if you're curious about color science, you have a couple more opportunities here at this conference. Uh, at the left here, two of my colleagues from RIT are giving a course tomorrow morning on fundamentals of color science. On Tuesday, I'm giving a course on color in advanced displays, which assumes you know a bit about color, so it's kind of an intermediate level class. So take Jim's, Jim and David's course first if you want to come see that. And then not a SIGGRAPH thing, but coming up soon online, so all of you can attend, is a course on color appearance by Mark Fairchild, who is the department head of my department and also the author of a really good book on color appearance. So check that out if you like. Brings me to the end. Yeah? Next up is Danielle.
Uh, it's nice to be back at CGRAF. Uh, I started in computer science. I was a student volunteer in 1996. <laughs> I've been back several times since. But um, I deal with color science all the time. Um, the, I have direct lighting for Pixar, and uh, the idea of a color inside my head getting to the lighter into the computers to show up on every computer at Pixar the same way, and then out into theaters and phones and everything the same color um, is something we deal with. But today I'm going to talk about much more of, of the practice of using color in our films. So um, I've been at Pixar for uh, over 20 years, worked on a bunch of films, so I've seen a wide variety of the way that color is used in film. Um, a pretty typical way we use color to tell story is with saturation. You'll see this all over the place. So if we go back to the first Incredibles, here's the color script, which is the way we kind of map out um, with color, the emotion of the story, um, it's, it's doing things like time of day, weather, color, and light to help tell the emotion of the story. I'll talk about it a little bit more later. Um, but for the original Incredibles, there's the early part of the film where it's this flashback to the heyday of, of, um, of superheroes, and it's almost these like candy colors. It's so oversaturated. And then we get to when uh, Bob or Mr. Incredible is in InsuraCare and all the color is sapped out of it because his life is so boring. Um, and so it's a very easy way just with color to help tell the story. And then when he gets back to superhero fighting, um, we, we punch the colors back up. So it's, it's a really easy way to use color to help support the story, the emotion of the story. Um, obviously, hue is a big one too. So um, if we take this shot from Toy Story 3, uh, we've got Buzz in a room, and you would never say whether this is happy or sad, or um, there, there's not a lot of emotion to this. But once you get the color and the lighting in there, um, we get this green light coming from the vending machine, and it starts to feel maybe eerie or ominous, and, and you're pretty certain this is not like Buzz's best day in his, in his toy life. Um, and in that same way, we use uh, warm colors here in this shot from Coco to convey the warmth of family, the setting of, of Mexico. So you have all these sort of ex, uh, expected associations with color, but we run into some unexpected ones too. And one of these happened on Wally, -E where a lot of times on our film, we'll do an early, we call it a diorama. And so it's maybe one shot, maybe it's a series of shots. And what we're doing is really cheaply putting together uh, a scene. And so we're not spending a bunch of time and money on it, but we want to take things to kind of a final image so that we learn all the things that we need to execute through the movie. So we can refine our technology. So instead of executing in one shot, you can do it in 2,000 shots. Um, you can see the, the garbage cubes here on the top look kind of stupid. Wally looks a little goofy. Um, but it's a way of sort of figuring out what we need to do for the movie. So here's a shot from the diorama. Um, we learn that Wally looks too frail to believably have lasted 700 years, but if you also notice the sky and the atmosphere, it's sort of red. And because Wally, there's no dialogue in the first 30 or 40 minutes of the movie, we have to do an enormous amount of visual storytelling. And it turns out that when you present people with a science fiction film with some red in it, everyone thinks it's Mars. And so we're trying to tell you it's Earth, it's 700 years later, it's polluted, Wally's the only one there, and if I mess up in the lighting and make it kind of reddish atmosphere, then suddenly I've, I've sort of ruined the story in a way. And so in the actual movie, after discovering red is associated with Mars, we keep the atmosphere really more in this, this sort of um, monochromatic world, and we go from sort of whites and yellows and oranges. Um, set pieces can be red, but it's really about the atmosphere, it can't be. When you get into something like Finding Nemo, we get the beautiful sort of underwater world. Um, we get to various shots where it's very traditionally sort of colored underwater scene. Then when we get to the end of the film, when things are not going well, we can take it to the screen. It's pretty believable as sort of polluted water. But you take a scene like the jellyfish scene, and we're going quite pink with it. It gets pinker and pinker than this image, um, which I don't think you probably ever see pink water generally um, when you're diving. But um, we needed it to feel really wonderful and beautiful so Dory would go into this field of jellyfish so that we, she would get herself in trouble, essentially. And so. For certain underwater, for all of underwater, there are certain things that we know we have to keep looking really like sort of true underwater in the real world. But we also know there's things we can push and pull for the story. And color turned out to be one we had a lot of latitude with and the, the audience would still believe it. Now, um, there's a multitude of ways we can use color to summon place. Um, this happened all over the place in Coco. Um, 
for a lot of our movies, we go take research trips. This was incredibly important for Coco because we're trying to recreate Mexico um, and we don't want to look like idiots that get Mexico wrong. So on these research trips, we go down for the Day of the Dead holiday and, and one of the more spectacular things I have ever seen is the cemeteries decorated for the holiday. And so it's this sort of riot of color from the marigolds and these magenta colored flowers, the celosia, set against the backdrop of the cemeteries with the green plants and stuff. Um, and you can see just what a spectacle it is. And then going back to those same places at night where um, it's the same scene but bathed in candlelight. And so just with the change in the sort of lighting, you get this whole other scene that was really fantastic. And then we went to these celebrations for the Day of the Dead holiday, and it's, it's again, a riot of color with um, the papel piccato, they're called these banners um, that are usually made of tissue paper, they're made out of plastic here. Um, we got some good fireworks going. Clearly not a lot of insurance problems here. Um, and then as we walk around the streets for the holiday, the buildings are, are bathed in these very saturated lights, which was quite festive and inspiring. Um, and of course, because I'm super lighting nerd, I'm running around looking at all the different light types and the different colors they're sort of casting and how we can incorporate that to capture Mexico and sort of sum in place. And one of my favorite things is walking through the markets. Um, everyone's sitting under these, those sort of painter's tarps that are colored with the sunlight filtering through and it casts everything in this colored light that I thought was quite magical. Um, and so then wrapping that into the film and trying to get the tarps in there to help um, get this color to, to summon Mexico. Um, here you can see we're, we're wrapping all those colors in where we have the papel picado, we've got the, the truck full of flowers, we're putting sprinkling in all these different kinds of lights with various, various colors to try and get an authentic Mexico. Um, now, the thing is, there's no rule book for color. You might be wanting some, like, you know, there's a guide for color. And it's, there's certain things that you think, well, green is this or red is this. But really, it comes down to just using your sort of gut instinct for color in the end. Uh, we were lighting this scene in Coco, which um, is just after the sun's gone down. So it's these beautiful sort of purples and pinks. One of our very best lighters lit this. And he's shaping... Um, everything with color instead of value, quite tricky. And it looked beautiful, and it was perfectly suited for the scene. It's a little bit melancholy after the sun's gone down. And it was the day before we were going to show it to the director. And I thought, well, it's really beautiful, but there was a sort of nagging voice in my head. It doesn't look Mexico enough. Like, we haven't done our job. And so uh, in this scene, you can see there's a kitchen behind Miguel. And before this, there was no light in that kitchen. It was just sort of left dark. And so I asked the lighter if he could put a green fluorescent light in there. Now, normally, you know, going back to this shot, green, we've sort of already said, is maybe eerie or ominous a lot of times if you see it, especially that sort of fluorescent light. But in this case, to me, it said Mexico. And so I was banking on the fact it said more Mexico than it did eerie and ominous, which wasn't right for the scene. Um, normally, I would run something like this by the director ahead of time, but it was the day before, and so it was a little bit of a Hail Mary. I wasn't really sure what reaction we were going to get. Um, so we showed it to the director, um, slightly apprehensive, and he, he was really excited by it. He says, oh, Danielle, that looks just like when we were down in Mexico. And so um, it was really exciting, but it was also this um, reminder that there are no rules for color, actually, that it's about we all have our own associations of color, just like it's perceptual and each person is perceiving it the only way. It's also about associations. Um, so going back to that idea of a color script, Here's the Coco color script. At the top, there's um, a nerdy mathy graph. And what this is is each sequence in the movie, and it's sort of mapping the emotion of it. So we know where the low lows are and the high highs. And what we're trying to do here is make sure that we've reserved enough, enough visual punch with color that when we hit a low or a high, that we can actually convey that to the audience. And so there's all kinds of ways we do this. And so um, going back to what I've already covered, some saturation. So this is a colorful movie. We are never going to go gray like Bob and Insurer Care, but in the, the sort of a little bit of drudgery of Miguel's life, we go a little more monochromatic. It's not so colorful. When we get into his hideout with all of his magical stuff, we do a bigger pop of color. Um, we're using hue in the same way. When we have a moment that we need to convey, ominous, um, we have the character walk over towards the pool and get this green underlit kind of thing that we, we take more yellow from the kind of bluish green we had a little earlier in the scene. When we're planning out the color script and doing this sort of design for the movie, 
We consider um, sometimes in movies we have two different worlds or three different worlds or something. And so in this we have the land of the living and the land of the dead. And, and as a design principle, we want to kind of separate them. So uh, the land of the living is very horizontal. The land of the dead is very um, vertical. But also, uh, in the land of the living, it mostly takes place during the day. There's a little bit of night. In the land of the dead, it's all night. And then getting more into color, the land of the living is predominantly warm colors. Land of the dead is every color, but, but predominantly cool colors. So we've got some design principles, but as I'm going through this, this is the first time that I have overseen the color script. And I realize that we have sort of a big problem, is that when we get to the land of the dead, um, like I said, it all takes place at night, so I have no time of day to convey emotion. There is no weather in this world, so I have no weather to convey emotion. It can't be a bright sunny day or a storm coming. And in terms of color, there's so much color in here that I, I'm at a loss as to how to properly use color to, to really have that visual punch that I need. So a lot of the tools have been taken away. Um, so what do we do with the land of the dead? Well, I go back to my experience on Wally -E, um, and the color script from Wally. -E, this is part of it that Ralph Eggleston, the production designer, put together. And he was insistent that there be no green in this beginning part of the movie. And the whole sort of crux of the matter is that there's no living things on the world anymore. And so if we see no green throughout the whole beginning of the movie, when Wally -E finds the plant, you get this intense visual punch of a saturated color, but the green that you have not seen for probably 20 or 30 minutes. And so it has this visual impact that you're going for. And so when we get into the land of the dead, where it's this riot of color, the way to get the sort of quieter, moodier moments for the audience is actually to reduce the colors way down. And so when we get into the place where we have an emotional moment, we pull a lot of the color wheel out of there. Or even when we get to a point where it feels like the audience needs a break from all of that visual craziness and color, we reduce the color way down. And in that way, we can kind of modulate the emotion appropriately for what we need. So in the end, um, you know, while you th might think about colors as numbers like RGB or something, or maybe wavelengths or hue, saturation, and value, it's really, if you dig a little deeper, you can find that they're actually emotions and tell stories. Thank you. Okay, we have time for a lot of questions. We're going to ask them among ourselves, but we'd like to open the audience up. Does anyone have any questions that you've been sitting there waiting for? Please come to the microphone. It's being live streamed. Thank you. It was really great. Um, I have a question from Nick. Um, Extra is actually they're doing a great job of you know making a standard color palette, like a, a passport color checker, and so on and so forth. And I find it very hard to find a spectral data for color chart. And it seems you guys are doing lots of revision, but it's really hard to get you know, accurate spectral data, I don't know, two degree observer or something like that, with each revision. This is one of the things that actually I would like to see <laughs> more updates on that. And the other thing is the extra color chart calibration, it's very black box. Um, there's no documentation how you guys actually doing the calibration under the hood. So it's very hard for other people that want to basically achieve the similar result outside that um, x uh, e ecosystem. Um, no. Thanks. Uh, that's really good feedback. I think that's something that we can take back to the team that actually runs that. Um, and actually, I'd be happy to get your contact info afterwards. In touch. I have another question for Michael. <laughs> um, so we've seen, you've been talking about the chromatic adaptation. Um, what do you think of uh, future for a spectral adaptation? Do you think the spectral adaptation might actually replace the chromatic or, um, or are, are we sure? Or are we need to uh, stick with the chromatic for now? Um, that's a really interesting question. So I think a lot of things, people are starting to pay attention to spectral things a lot more now, especially in lighting. Uh, when it comes down to your eyeballs, you, you, you never will perceive the whole spectrum, right? You still only have three cones that are going to distinguish the color. Um, the, spe the, the light spectrum is going to get in integrated down by those sensitivities 
um, to a kind of a trichromatic way of, uh, of perceiving things. So the chromatic adaptation, the sort of three-channelness of, of color will, will probably never go, never go away. Um, one place where this is becoming a big issue at the moment is with lighting, with LED lighting. You know, we've had 100, 100 years of tungsten lighting with smooth spectra and uh, object colors that are predictable under that kind of spectral lighting or daylight, which is also fairly smooth and, uh, and uniform. But now with LEDs, we can have all sorts of spiky things like uh, LED composite spectra or uh, phosphor converted whites with big spikes and big transitions. And so um, while it doesn't change the nature of the adaptation, it, it introduces a lot of complications for uh, color matching and, and adapting to things under different lights. So that's off the top of my head one thing that I would think of that, that spectrally is becoming more interesting. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. I just had a quick question. Um, at one point, you showed a image where you had the uh, x right calibration um, chart, and you had basically calibrated both of them, but then there was still difference between the two colors that were shown in the left and the right image after calibration. Um, are you only doing color or, say, chroma calibration and then not doing brightness calibration? And if so, what's the reason for that? So you're, you're asking about the, the color checker image where I showed the, the paired, right? So um, to answer the, the first part of the question, uh, they were, it was just a white balance, like a camera white balance adjustment, like you would do in Lightroom or uh, right. Capture, um, which then preserves the luminance differences per color, right. which is much like how you would see it with your own eyes. So that's why it was left like that. So it was not creating a whole characterization of the input uh, from the from the rest of the patches. Got it, so it's not using what, what x right would do, which actually calibrates all the colors and like removes the light characterization from the image, so you get a, like a good albedo or something. Yeah, yeah. got it. And, and it's a little bit of a contrived example, and uh, you know, I'm still relying on a camera and a display to show you what it looks like, which is always a bit hairy, so yeah. It just conceptually, that was the point, though, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, I have a question for Danielle. Um, so as part of pre-production process, color script is very essential to like tell a story and color and lighting can tell so much story by itself. So how do you go about putting one color script together? Do you work on each cell individually and then put them together? Or does the team always have like um, an idea of a wider scheme of color? Um, I'd say there are not necessarily rules for how you do it. It's, it's um, more about how you're going to convey the information. And so um, on the Coco one, we had kind of an image for each sequence mostly, so each scene in the movie. Um, I've seen it done where it's way less than that. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more than that. It's really about um, enough to convey it. So the way I started with it was knowing kind of what the the high points are, and then choosing a couple of the kind of mid-range points and getting those and then starting to fill in in between to make sure that I had what I needed. Um, and that felt like it worked pretty well. And it was, I was sort of overseeing it, but working with the production designer, and then there were, I think, three or four people ended up doing paintings for it, so kind of collaborating on all of that and trying to get it so it was a co one cohesive thing. That's the general gist of it, though. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, everything was great. Uh, I have a question for all of you. It's kind of a general question. Uh, when working with designers that work specifically in 2D, specifically with digital color, uh, what is the easiest way you found to explain to them that sort of spectral data? That when you, let's say, convert that 2D image into a 3D image, uh, all those material attributes and all that spectral data that comes with it uh, might affect the color. How do you find is the easiest way to explain that to them? <laughs> you can tell we don't do a ton of explaining of spectral data to designers, but no, it's, it's, uh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, I typically start with a curve and just say, look, I mean, this is, this is what that color is. And so, and, and the people that you work with who are going to be using this can you, you know, you, like the designer may not necessarily need the spectral data for exactly what they're doing, but if they specify a color and they know what the spectral data is and they can pass it on, they're making life easy for everybody else. 
Exactly. Um, and so that's, that's generally the message is, you know, if you give all of the information, including that spectral curve, you're going you're gonna to speed up your entire process and you're going to make it really easy. Um, but I, I mean, I typically don't get into the specifics of, you know, really just what exactly it is because they don't really need it necessarily. Thank you. That's well. I, I could add maybe one little thing. I, in terms of showing people things, right, yeah. it, it can be very nice and visual. Um, showing an example of metamerism is nice. So metamerism is the phenomenon where two different spectra look the same under a given light source or something like that. So, you know, that's how we get full color on these displays with combination of red, green, and blue, and, and with printing with combinations of ink. So if you can show somebody a paint sample and a printed sample in CMYK that look the same, perhaps, uh, you can also show them how it looks the same under one light source and then not the same under a different light source. Um, and then you can talk about the spectral composition of those uh, separately, I think. So whenever you can, showing examples will, is uh, helpful. Excellent. Thank you. Short microphone. Uh, I have a creative question for Danielle. With uh, color scripting and designing lighting, you're doing basically painting. And in the realm of HDR, I'm curious whether you consider these in your creative decisions or whether it's just, whether it's useful or whether it's just distracting. Like consider you know, HDR, is that? Yeah. 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 Um, like you added the light in the background and in HDR, if you don't tone map it or think about tone mapping, it could be the, this really distracting light in the background. Yeah. Um, we have been, over the last several years, as, as the, um, sort of contrast ratio has changed on displays and stuff with HDR, definitely have had to think a lot about that. We always choose sort of, um, we choose to author for what is going to be the thing most seen, so really in the, in the yeah. cinema, um, and then try to understand how it's gonna look in HDR. Uh, an example is for Monsters University, when HDR was first coming out and we, we look at Monsters University under HDR, Mar, HDR there's flashlights and they look white, but when you look at them in HDR, they look pink, which is really wrong because the red channel was, was pushed way far, but you would never notice that. And so we're trying to catch those kinds of things so it will look reasonable in HDR. We're now color grading for HDR, uh, HDR and trying to figure out like, uh, there were scenes in Coco that I had to just clamp them because the flames on the candles all looked, they didn't look bright anymore, they looked really stupid. Yeah. And so, while it pained me, I would just clamp it so that it at least looked the way it was intended, but you don't get to take advantage of the extra range you have. So um, I don't know that it's the best way to make use of it yet, but it's the way that we can kind of still author um, where everyone at their desktop can see what the intention is. And hopefully at some point we get to author for HDR and, and make sure the, the sort of lower range stuff still works. Thanks. Um, hi, so I enjoyed all of your presentations, but this is specifically for Danielle. Um, Mike talked a little bit about chromatic and luminescent adaptation, and I know that Unity is doing some things in post-processing files where like, they are automatically procedurally generating that adaptation. Um, so I was just wondering, when you have adjacent scenes that are like one that's indoor and the next one that's outdoors and like the lighting is completely different, um, how much of that is actually done manually through lighting to get that weird like oversaturation and then um, like adaptation into you're actually seeing things normally yeah and how much of that is done in post-processing uh it's it's all done in lighting all very um manually done <laughs> um we love to have as much control as possible and so if you're going to do something like uh you in a live action film, if you were inside and walk outside and the exposure kind of blows out and then settles down, what would happen with, with a regular camera? If that ends up in one of our movies, it's be probably because it's, it's an actual style choice because we actually have to manually do that. There's probably some ways now where we could, we could do it with less work than it used to be, but it's, it's, a, it's more of a stylistic choice where we're deciding how much of those um, things to pull in from real world kind of cameras and exposure and stuff um, and layer them into our movies like um, uh, lens flares, like that kind of thing where um, I was telling these guys at dinner last night that we had this live action director that was completely flummoxed by us trying to recreate lens flares for Wally to evoke old science fiction movies and he's like, I've spent my whole career trying to avoid those lens flares and you guys are trying to like get them accurate. And so, so they're, they end up being sort of stylistic choices for us. 
kind of a similar question for authoring HDR content. And uh, do you guys, there's currently a shift to use more physical values in order to get more realistic lighting contrasts and ratios. Um, but just in terms of, you know, uh, Michael showed the slide where the color saturation is different. And plus, after you feed it through a tone mapper, depending on the tone mapper choice, we either like roll off really high, uh, high values to white, uh, like in the ACES tone mapper curve, or we try to preserve contrast. And then it seems like we're fighting this a lot in terms of uh, sometimes the art director is like, oh, we need more saturation in the brights. And it's like, oh, no, I like the kind of soft, filmic look. Uh, what are your thoughts on that in terms of going forward and how you guys how are you guys approaching that problem? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, we, we use sort of the physically correct stuff to get us to a certain place, sort of harnessing the power of the computer in a way, um, to get us to a certain place. But like, what I'm interested in is making movies and having the tools I need to tell the story. And so needing the capability to break out of the physically correct when I can, which isn't always easy because it's, it's sort of carefully um, orchestrated to give you the physically correct. Um, so trying to break out of that so that you can tell a story. Um, and so there's certainly competing visions of what the stylization of a film is sometimes with the production designer who wants one thing or maybe doesn't totally understand what's happening in the computer. And so I think that problem always exists. But um, sort of trying to have the best of both worlds with some of the physical and then being able to, to get away from that where you need to to stylize. Is that just more of like uh, approaching it in sort of the post process and just grading it and but the lighter is kind of set up a more, it's, I guess, try to provide a good baseline? You could things. certainly do that. We do almost nothing in post in oh, most okay. movies. Like we, we do more fi fixing problems and authoring for different platform for the way it's released. Okay. Um, we tend to get everything kind of looking the way it's supposed to um, in, our, in our sort of final renders okay. and much less in the post-processing. And so it's really about figuring out the style of the film and so um, sort of using that physically correct up to a point and then kind of working from there. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi there. Um, thanks a lot to everyone. I have a couple of questions for Danielle, especially just after what you said. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, basically, I was wondering, Jose was showing how um, when you have kind of a, a color scheme in, in, in any digital image, you can approximate, you can, you can analyze how close those relative strong colors are to what would be ideal, right? And so my first question would be, you know, when you come back from these reference pictures from Mexico, how much do you bother to then tweak and figure out whether or not the relations between these colors are ideal or not, or is it just an eye kind of thing? my first question. And the second one is just curious, I don't know how much you can speak to this, but it's, you know, I, I imagine you come up with a very clean kind of color board um, and then you have a whole bunch of lighters that are all working on their own trying to figure out, you know, how to light each scene. How does that information get distributed out to them so that they know that they're hitting the marks and, and it's, or is it just the generalized process at the very end of the movie? Sure. Um, well, if Jose would give me that color picker, <laughs> maybe I could, that thing was so cool. Um, you know, with the pictures from Mexico, like I think we're all um, looking at those having been in Mexico and sort of soaking it in, and it's much more about um, instinctual. The art department definitely came up with, um, Harley Jessup was the production designer, he came up with a color palette, color palette for Coco um, that he was using as his reference at all times, but it's, it, we aren't doing things on the order of the cool stuff that Jose was showing. And so um, I think it's a little more instinctual than we get super um, kind of brainy about it maybe. Um, in terms of the lighting, so we have um, director of photography on each film for lighting. So that's what I did on like Wally Brave and Coco. And so I see all of the lighters every day. I know what the the color script is, I know what the director wants, I know what I'm trying to get, and so it's up to me to actually get all of the lighters lighting to look like it's in the same world and kind of hitting all of those goals. Um, and we also have our tools set up so that we have, a, we have continuity, so we kind of worked in these inheritance layers so that, and the lighters kind of know what they can change from the level above that will work and what will break things and make the discontinuities. 
Um, but it's, it's not easy, but um, we do the best we can, I suppose. Great job, great. Thank you. Hi. I, on a daily basis, often work in uh, the world of color compression. And so my job, we will often look at problems of how can we deconstruct a color space and then um, compress it and then re reconstruct it in, a, in another environment. Uh, so for example, just the basics of DXD compression and um, ripping things apart from RGB into chroma um, and value uh, and then reconstructing them later. And we've used various methods to avoid compression problems so that we can get a higher fidelity on screen. One of the classic problems being with DXT1 compression, you'll see your grayscales go pink or green because of the extra bit that's involved. Do you guys have any thoughts or um, any interesting papers you've read recently that kind of talk about color compression and solving some of those problems of digitization and quantization errors? <laughs> Nothing. Sorry, no. <laughs> okay, thank you. You stumped us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I was thinking in like something like the Pantone system, you have some very well defined spectral colors. And I know it's not really maybe the goal of the system, but what if you want to st then start blending the colors? Like, for example, you have some color here, some color here, and you want to print a gradient between them on brown cardboard or something. Is there like some sort of model for interpolating between the colors, or is it a non-issue? Or uh, I mean, going between them, would it, you thinking specifically uh, using just Pantone colors, or well, any, even, any even sort of gradient between them? Yeah, but if, does Pantone have some sort of opinion on that? The interpolation between colors, or it, no? It's a good question. It, it's actually something we're uh, we're working on in one of our tools right now, which is why I asked the question back. But um, we, I mean, we're trying to do it right now with our existing colors in a way where you could pick two and then get some sort of a bridge between them. Um, and one of the, you know one of the challenges is that our our color system is not mathematical. And so for some colors, there are a ton of Pantone values between them. For others, like, you know, you're lucky if you get one or two. Um, it's, it's that random in some cases. Um, so, you know, there's, I guess there's different ways that we could handle it. But, yeah, it, it's, not as, it's not super straightforward with the way the system is today. And it, it takes us, it can take us over... You know, let's say we did that and we found, like, we just have some really big gaps in certain areas in our system. Um, it can take us, you know, over a year, sometimes two years, to add new colors to the system. So um, it's, not, it's not quick to do that either, but it's a, it's a really interesting question because it is something we're thinking about, and we know that that's a use case people have. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to point out that if you look at your tag or one right over here from NVIDIA. That is actually a specific color that they worked with x ray correct? They worked with x ray to make their own NVIDIA color. There actually is an NVIDIA green that's specifically, and it's got Munsell and it's got Pantone values associated with it. And I was going, wanted to ask Nick how long it takes to create a color like that? Uh, you know, if it's, a, if it's a color that's for a customer, that is not going to go in the Pantone system. It can be pretty quick. It's it's a you know there, there's a there's an element of consulting to it where you're just trying to figure out what the what the person wants to convey with their color, and then what exactly that customer is or what, what exactly that color is, and then is that color achievable on the materials that they want the color on. So um, it's much easier. Like we we did something like this with Minions Yellow um, some years ago, where like. You know, we just we basically went out and said, okay, it's got to be on screen, it's got to be on you know, these ten materials, and we'll produce the color and we'll produce the values that go with it and provide it. Um, if it's something, sometimes people actually ask if they can add a color to the Pantone system, and it sort it kind of goes into this queue of like, all right, well, the next time we we do a color update, we're going to try to hit this color and see if we can get it in there, and it's not always a guarantee because. Um, 
some, you know, sometimes you'll have a color and it's so close to an existing Pantone color that you're either not going to be able to fit it in the book or in, you know, some people may not even be able to distinguish between it, you know, what the Pantone color is and what the new color is. Um, and all of this goes into it taking us a lot of time to get, you know, a mass of colors into our, into our system. But definitely, it can be fast, it can be slow, it depends. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions or any of the panelists? Hey, I, I have a thought, actually. I've been mulling over this color compression question that I, I didn't want to say no to. Um, I don't really work on compression, so maybe this is, uh, doesn't really fit. But from work on displays, um, one thing that came to mind was uh, there are color sequential displays. Sometimes projectors do this that flash the red and then green and then blue field very quickly so that your eye integrates them, but it's still flashing those colors. And sometimes you perceive flicker or color breakup and things with those. So one way to mitigate that is to, um, to adjust the, so if, if you have LEDs that are driving this color uh, setup, you can sort of combine them. So your subfields, instead of being pure red, pure green, pure, pure blue, could be intermediate colors, right? You take a little bit of green and a little bit of yellow mix, or I'm sorry, a little bit of red and green and make some sort of a yellow field. Um, in there, and so depending on sort of the the palette of colors that you're trying to make in a given frame of, of video, you would choose sort of a smaller subgamut of your RGB available. Um, so I'm trying to relate this to the compression thing, thinking maybe if you were doing something like uh, indexed color, except you're sort of indexing which primaries you mean for a given frame or a given uh, set of video, that you could do something like that. That might mean you could do more with fewer bits because you're, you're trying to address a smaller piece of color space. So I don't know if anybody's tried anything like that, but that's just an idea. <laughs> Any more questions? I just wanted to alert everyone. Some of the things that Mike covered, there is an app for the iPad that is um, devoted to work by Joseph Albers, and Albers spent a lot of time on what they call the homage to the square. In other words, he painted squares nested inside of each other. And if you uh, get that app, it's from the Yale Press. Um, it's a, um, down, you can use the color examples and learn how to do the color combinations of some of the things that he was talking about in this example. You have to, you have an iPad to do it, but it's a very good tool to have. Well, thank you all for coming, and I want to thank you very much for it. And we hope you enjoyed yourself in the world of color. Thank you. Thanks to all the panelists.